Good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Gautam Rao. I'm the CTO at Portworks. Uh, thanks for being here this afternoon. I see a lot of friendly faces here in the audience, too. Uh, I'm here today to talk about deploying stateful applications with Docker. Um, look, I think, you know, we all know de deploying ephemeral apps is, it's, it's easy. We know how to deploy ephemeral apps, and in an ideal world, everything would just be ephemeral, but it's not. Um, we have state to deal with, and what enterprises are looking for is a platform to deploy um, stateful applications in a cloud-native way. Um, I'm going to try and uh, do justice to my 15 minutes, and uh, what I really want to spend time on is uh, showing you a demo um, in how we can uh, deploy uh, applications with enterprise quality, and what I'm talking about is high availability, um, data protection, and things like that, using Docker, um, using schedulers like Kubernetes, Mesosphere, Swarm. Um, these are the things that I want to try and really quickly highlight today. A um, little bit of background. Um, the reason, uh, uh, so there's been a transformation that's happening in the data center, and the transformation uh, has been happening um, along two um, um, angles here. One is around um, the hardware side. There's been a push to move toward commodity infrastructure, away from big iron, siloed, um, um, uh, custom SAN and NAS type of solutions to a more of a cloud-native platform, which is what I'm showing there on the right-hand side. And a new stack is emerging, and the stack comp is comprised of a minimalistic OS, applications deployed um, as containers using technologies like Docker, um, using a scheduler like Swarm, Kubernetes. Um, that's the new stack that people are moving toward. And the reason is we've evolved as a software organization. We, don't, we no longer build monolithic applications that uh, can be packaged and deployed as one machine. We write service-oriented code. Um, we like to package our applications using containers, deploy them fluidly, um, um, and, 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 and have that cloud-native experience as we're uh, managing and deploying and scaling our applications. Everything is fine until you have to handle state. Here's an example of an application that is comprised of three containers. Uh, let's say I have an Nginx container talking um, over a well-known protocol, maybe restfully to some application logic running written in Python, running in another container, talking um, over SQL to a container that uh, is hosting my SQL. That's fine up until the point that somebody has to provision storage to the MySQL container. And this is where the DevOps cycle breaks, and you have to resort to uh, old school IT provisioning of storage. Somebody has to go in, find the disk resources, uh, find the servers that they will provision the storage to, and then deploy the applications on it. And that's really not a cloud native experience. And that's where you start realizing that why can't I just live in an ephemeral world? Problem is, you have to deal with state. And if you think about it, the problem is that the type of state or storage that you're provisioning weren't, were not meant for containers, and really the, the crux of the problem is applications don't want volumes. The notion of a volume or a LUN that we've been used to, they were designed or meant for host operating systems, they're designed for uh, machines, but they're really, nobody writes an application with a LUN in mind or a volume in mind. That's just not how we write um, application code. Again, go, uh, it goes back to what are we trying to do here? We like to live in a world of service-oriented architecture, so everything needs to be a service. What you want to do is think of your storage needs as a service. You want to think about how you consume storage, the operations that you do, what's known as CRUD, where you have to create a resource, where you have to read storage. You want all of that to be service-oriented. So you really want to think of storage as just yet another data service um, container that you have to manage. And that's where Portworks comes in. I'm really here to talk a lot about what Portworks does. Portworks delivers storage as a container. Think of us as providing all of that enterprise-grade um, uh, storage functionality delivered as a container that provides uh, storage as a service to the rest of your application stack. So you deploy Portworks alongside the rest of your application containers just as if you're deploying um, uh, an elongated application stack. And what this um, Portworks container then does is it provides a common denominator platform from which storage services can be uh, derived. What it empowers your DevOps teams to do is not have to worry about the underlying storage resources. You no longer have to care about if you're running in AWS, how do I get the storage resources off of EBS volumes? If you're running on-prem, how do I get my storage off of uh, maybe commodity servers with direct attached drives? You don't have to worry about these things. Um, so you 
uh, write your application stack, um, your uh, deployment practices are written to this notion of, like I said, a common denominator platform, and this stack can run and work as is, whether you're running in AWS or on-prem or you're moving to different, uh, moving from cloud A to cloud B. You just let Portworx, the data service container, handle all of that. Portworx is a software-defined storage solution that's written for uh, containers, and what I mean by that is it provisions virtual storage services, think of it as virtual volumes, that are container granular and scheduler integrated. So Portworx is aware of your application stack. For example, if you're deploying Cassandra, Portworx is aware of all of the Cassandra containers that are part of that application stack, will provision the necessary storage resources to each Cassandra container, make sure that, for example, two different Cassandra instances data don't end up on the same node because that would defeat the purpose of high availability. So it's these type of things that you don't have to operationally think about anymore and you can just deploy your Cassandra stack not having to worry about which machines it's going to end up on and how will the storage be provided to it. That's not something you have to worry about. You can programmatically deploy stateful applications. Um, essentially, think of deploying stateful applications ephemerally. Um, that'll become a little bit more clear um, when I switch to this demo. So the, um, let me just set this up here. The premise here is I have um, three uh, servers running in AWS. I want to show a couple of things. Um, deploying Portworx is as easy as just doing a Docker run Portworx. Um, even though in this demo I'm going to do things by hand by manually running Portworx and manually allocating a volume, all of this is done in an automated way directly via Docker. So if you're using something like Swarm, you would deploy the applications that I will deploy using Compose. You, if you want to allocate storage resources, you would just do that in your uh, Docker Compose. So what I'm going to do here, um, so I'll refer to these machines by their last octet, 218, 219, and 220. Um, each of these servers have a couple of EBS drives associated with it. Um, like I mentioned, Portworx, as a container, provides data services to the rest of your application. So the first thing it will do is uh, scan the local system, take a look at the EBS drives, figure out which zone and region it, it's in, and then as I bring up other nodes, they form a cluster. So you have a global pool of storage resources from which virtual volumes are derived. A key aspect of Portworx is we like hyperconvergence. Applications today want to run converged. Um, applications like Cassandra or if you're deploying HDFS like to run the compute where the data is local. So Portworx will uh, enable you to run your container on a node where it has carved out the actual storage resources. You don't have to do anything for this. Portworx takes care of that by working with your scheduler. So I'll uh, start Portworx up here on uh, 218. Um, everything that you need to run um, uh, to get this to work, the, the integration with Docker, known as the Docker volume driver, uh, our integration with the scheduler, our CLI, REST endpoint, everything runs within the container. As I bring the other nodes online, you'll see the global capacity increases from 127 to 300 to about half a terabyte. So this is called horizontal scaling. You can just keep adding nodes and uh, keep increasing your um, global uh, compute and storage capacity. Now what I'll do is I'll use the CLI uh, to uh, create a volume and I'll show you some of the options you have. Like I mentioned, I'm using the Portwork CLI to create the volume over here just so I can show you um, the plumbing and what happens under the hood. Normally you're just doing this directly to, through Docker. If we've done our job right, Portwork is really behind the scenes and um, you, meaning your DevOps uh, teams or your end users are really not aware of Portworx being there. Um, you, your user experience and user interface will be the Docker ecosystem. It will be the scheduler that you choose, uh, Swarm, Kubernetes, Mesosphere. You're doing everything through it. And Portworx is um, working in conjunction with those schedulers behind the scenes. So when I create a volume, I have a couple of options. Um, I can select the replication factor, block size, um, file system type. This demo is a little bit dated. We now support things like uh, a bring your own key encryption, uh, backup to S3, and so on. Um, what I'm really trying to um, demonstrate here is that the uh, operations that you do are container granular. That, what I mean by that is you don't have to set global storage policies like you would have to do if you're repurposing a traditional old school SAN like an EMC array and trying to provision storage to um, your container app containerized applications. And the reason this is important is you're probably not just deploying one application. 
um, you're probably building a platform as a service or an infrastructure as a service, and you may end up running different types of applications. There could be Elk stacks running, there could be Cassandra clusters running, there could be MySQL clusters running, and each one of these application stacks have different requirements. And so to be container granular is very important. Here I'll create a uh, volume which I'll just call demo volume one and set uh, the replication factor to three because in this demo I want to deploy MySQL which doesn't handle replication on its own. I created the volume on 219. Um, I will just use Docker and I'm sure you're all familiar with what's going on here but I'm just uh, dash Ving the Portworx volume into varlib MySQL which is where MySQL likes to keep its persistent storage. Again, um, this uh, is all hidden away from you because you're probably going to just use Swarm and have this in a compose script to deploy and run MySQL, but um, I really want to show what's happening under the hood. At this point, MySQL is running, and um, it doesn't actually see the underlying EBS volumes. It just sees the Portworx virtual volume. And that's key because mentally, this is the picture you should have in mind. You never want to physically bind your stateful application to the actual storage because then that's a boat anchor that you're left with forever. And it's important to understand that Portworx provides that virtualization layer so that your applications can live and move um, and operate independent of the uh, physical storage behind the scenes. And, and putting in that layer, uh, whatever technology you use, you need to have that virtualization layer that um, prevents you from having that physical binding. That's the key thing here. So here I have MySQL running. Um, it is uh, bound and attached on 220, so I'll connect to MySQL because I want to show you some cool things that you can do. In this uh, case, I will create a database. Um, I'll call it uh, demo. And um, what I'm trying to uh, show here is that everything that's happening is container granular. And I'll demonstrate that by uh, going to another system and taking a snapshot of that running MySQL container. Maybe I want to do a database upgrade. I want to make sure that the database will work with the new version of, the, of MySQL. So I took a snapshot and I'm starting a second parallel instance of MySQL on a different system. Forex clusters can scan uh, different zones. So this could be in a on a development machine, in a development data center, um, or in a development um, availability zone. Now I have two instances of MySQL running, one with production data and the other one which is a snapshot. I can see that both the, both the volumes are mounted and in use. I'll connect to the second uh, instance of MySQL and obviously if I dump the databases I expect to see the demo database and I do. Um, the other thing just to hit the point home is um, or originally I showed you how you can bring multiple nodes online to horizontally scale your cluster. You don't have to necessarily only do that. Let's say you're just running out of capacity and you want to add another drive. So just throw another drive into the equation. If you're using AWS, it's as easy as just attaching an EBS volume to any one of your EC2 instances. And you can see the capacity increases again from half a terabyte um, by 100 gigs. So all of this capacity management um, and, and uh, uh, abstracting away the physical resources from your application stack is, is really key here, and, uh, and hopefully this demo was uh, able to demonstrate that. In reality, your end users will probably be using something like this to deploy their applications. And here's an example of PodSpec. This is Kubernetes over here. And you can see that the same MySQL application is being deployed and the volume is being created in line. Um, here you can see a four terabyte volume is being requested with snapshots at 12 hour granularity, certain class of service. So what this really is trying to demonstrate is this notion of self-provisioning. Um, your end users can uh, no longer have to create an IT ticket to get storage provision. They don't have to worry about where this container is going to get deployed. Portworks will look at the type of class of service that's requested, influence the scheduler to deploy the container on a machine that's capable of delivering it. Um, Portworks is handling the replication under the hood, so in the event that the application dies or gets respawned or the machine fails, again, everything is being um, automated and taken care of behind the scenes. To show you uh, the kind of um, uh, advanced benefits your end users go, I just want to sort of riff along with that um, uh, MySQL uh, example. And here the premise is um, somebody in your team, um, the DevOps user has deployed MySQL and they run out of space. This happens in production, what do you do? The whole point behind us embracing service-oriented architectures and containers is to get um, that self, um, um, you know, that, that agility and things, and so that I can do things on my own, that uh, so-called credit card experience. And so here, what I'm gonna try and demonstrate is that um, I do a database insert, and you can see on the right-hand side, 
that uh, my SQL complaint saying that the database is full. I don't have to call IT, I can just go in and see why that happened, and if I look at the volume, you can see it says a few key things. It says that I had only allocated a 14 gig volume and all 14 gigs are in use. It also shows me other interesting things like the machines that this data is protected on and so forth. This, if you think about it, is a pretty hard problem at this point to solve because now you've deployed MySQL, presumably you have a few hundred instances, somebody has to go figure out where this MySQL is running, then you have to go in and provision storage to that machine and that's the easy part. You've added storage to the machine, but how do you get it into the application? Well, you have to bring the application down, uh, figure out how to um, uh, resize the database, um, and that's not something you want to do. Um, and with uh, using a virtualization technology like Portworx, uh, you don't have to do that. All I'll do is just go ahead and resize the volume. So I just do a pixie cuddle volume resize to 15 gigs. Without restarting the container, I can simply retry the database insert and this time it goes through. So this type of flexibility is very key uh, when you're operating um, stateful applications in production. Um, uh, hopefully what I'm trying to demonstrate here is Using technologies like Docker to um, you know, package your applications, using um, intelligent schedulers like Swarm, Kubernetes, Mesosphere to uh, provide you that um, cloud native compute experience and using software like Portworks to give you that cloud native stateful experience, um, that's really um, key over here. Just take really uh, maybe a few more minutes um, and then we'll um, have some time for Q&A. Just to wrap this up, the type of data services that you can expect out of the Portworx container are sort of uh, highlighted here. Um, your volumes can have a global namespace. You can expose um, S3 interfaces. Portworx can back up to S3. Um, you can enable encryption. Um, let's talk a little bit about encryption. Um, you can have uh, your your end users can deploy applications and they can use this notion of bring your own key encryption where each volume is encrypted differently with its own key. So taking an extreme example, let's just say I had just one disk. I can have two, three, n number of containers running on it. Each one of those containers are encrypted differently. And it's important that it's done this way because that encrypted data, is, it's encrypted throughout the data's life cycle. So as you back it up, as you back it up to S3 or move it across clouds, it's all encrypted with the same key. Um, and more importantly, you can support this notion of multi-tenancy. Multi so you can have different containers all running. You don't have to worry about how to segment different departments onto different machines and have different encryption policies for them. Um, just to really uh, dri drive home the notion of being uh, application aware, um, we're truly, uh, poor, it's not just being container aware, it's understanding a notion of an application stack. So here's an example of a uh, Cassandra being deployed and Portworx will place the data um, rack and region aware. So the last thing you want to have happen is two different Cassandra instances running where its data are placed on the same rack. Again, it defeats the purpose of high availability because if you lose a rack, you've lost two instances. And so Portworx will make intelligent placement decisions that way. Um, and the container granularity part is important because you can set different policies. You can have policies for Cassandra where you may choose a lower replication factor because Cassandra handles its own replication. Uh, and you can choose a higher protection level for something like Postgres. Um, check us out at our booth. Uh, there's a lot more that I'd like to show, but I'm cognizant of the time. Uh, really appreciate you guys coming here. Um, we have a booth. If you guys want a whack-a-mole, uh, there's a cool game. You can try and uh, kill MySQL instances and, uh, you know, just in a fun way, try and see how the Portworx uh, technology works. Uh, if you have any questions, this will be a good time. There's a mic over there. Okay. Any questions, guys? Yes, the question here is, uh, does encryption work for databases? And the answer is yes. The data is encrypted before the data even hits the disk. Um, so as the data is being replicated to different systems, it's replicated encrypted. And um, if you back up the data, it's encrypted. If you choose to uh, repatriate the data or move your application from machine A to machine B or cluster A to cluster B, it stays encrypted with that same key. What if I were to move my application from one cloud provider to another? Good. 
Great question. Yeah, so uh, Polworks does enable multi-cloud uh, cluster straddling multi-cloud. Even in that case, your data is still encrypted. Sorry, the question here was uh, what happens if I move my application stack from cloud provider A to cloud provider B? It remains encrypted and Polworks will handle that. There's good use cases on the website for that. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, question here is, is the QoS set at a, a volume level or a Docker level? And it's set at a volume level, which um, it's, it's one, it maps, a volume typically maps one to one with a container. Sometimes containers can have more than one volume and you can then set different QoS levels. Sorry, there was a question there? Yeah, you, you had IOPS on the slide. How do you get to with performance? Sorry. You set different performance levels for uh, different volumes? Mm -hmm. So because Portworks is software, uh, obviously the IOPS uh, mileage varies. It depends on the underlying physical infrastructure. What Portworks does is when it uh, first starts up, it scans a system's resources and other nodes in the cluster. So it generally fingerprints your servers and puts them in three buckets, high, medium, and low, and you can choose that way. Do you have an API for blob storage? API for blob storage? So the question is, do we have an API for blob storage? So you can, you can allocate a blob uh, pool, which is basically no file system, and you can allocate a raw block device and use it however you want. There is a RESTful API to uh, operate on it. Um, it's uh, documented on our site. If you go to docs.porworks.com, docs.porworks.com, a lot of that information is there as well. So a question here. Okay, the, the question is, are volume shared between nodes, and how fast um, is, uh, does that happen? Uh, how fast, how long before another node can see a volume's data? And so I'll answer that in two parts. Um, we have, a, there's a notion of something called a shared volume, where a single volume can at any point in time be mounted into multiple containers at the same time, even if the containers are running on different hosts. Data is instantly accessible. So as soon as an application writes data, and as long as it, uh, you know, it, it gives you NFS style semantics, even though it's not using NFS. So as long as the application writes the data and it flushes it, uh, the data is immediately visible. Um, another way to parse that question is uh, when Portworx is uh, replicating data. So normally for databases, you wouldn't use shared volumes. If you're using a regular volume and you have an, a replication on, data is immediately uh, made available on a quorum number of nodes before it's acknowledged back to the application. So in that aspect, it's in instantaneous. The amount of time that it takes for that to happen is network bandwidth related. So if you were to artificially constrain the network bandwidth, obviously you can induce delays. But we have to wait for acknowledgement from a quorum number of nodes. Okay, so I'm uh, up on time. Uh, please visit us at our booth. Um, there, I'm sure you have a lot more questions. We have a lot of people there that can uh, answer them. And again, I appreciate you for uh, sitting here and uh, listening um, to hear our story. Speak this. Is that okay? Just, yeah, it's fine. Just a time. Yeah, totally totally fine. Your yeah. Are we supposed to be on the screen? Yeah. Are you in yeah. presenter mode? Or you want to go ahead and open I'd prefer not to do presenter mode. Over the, well, no, that's why I just usually, whatever mode you're going to be in. It, whatever you're comfortable with. Whatever you're comfortable with. Because you can go over a little bit, but like, it starts to get real on. I'll start sure. jumping up and down over there. Okay. That's you. All right, cool. Okay. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Morello. I'm the uh, CTO for Twistlock. Uh, we're a company that's been around for a couple of years, and really the, the fundamental premise of Twistlock is we're trying to help customers leverage some of the capabilities of containers to improve the security of the applications they run within the containers. Uh, if you guys have you know, seen the press and analysts and so forth over the past couple of years, 
Well, it seems to be so a little bit of a noise, I guess, about you know container security and you know, are there gaps in container security and so forth. And of course, like any new technology, there's different threats and risks that you have to address. But we fundamentally believe that that containers are actually a real opportunity for a security company to change some of the fundamental concepts and fundamental approaches that people have to do with security in a way that's very positive and beneficial. And so what I'm going to talk with you guys about today is, is really what those changes are, what that looks like, and actually show you a little bit about how we do that within Twistlock uh, as an example of, of how you can leverage that in, in other areas and other products as well. So the, this whole trend really started with this notion of, of DevOps, and I guess the, the, the inflection point we saw here was as organizations adopt these agile development processes in which they're going to be um, no longer just simply you know, building an application in development and then handing it off to somebody in operations to deploy, but instead those teams are working together very closely and the same teams that are, that are operating the app are the ones that are deploying the application. The lines that have sort of segmented out like what was pre-production, what was test, what was development versus uh, the security team's responsibility have really been blurred a lot. You know, so in the old world security model, you might think of if I'm building a, let's say a WordPress application, as a developer, I would sit down with my security team and describe the way that application would work, right? I would tell them this front end virtual machine, you know, runs this version of Apache, it writes to this file path on this database, which runs on this IP address and so forth. And if you had a security team that was really on the ball, they would go to a few different tools to configure some protections for that application, right? They would go to a host-based security tool and set up some IP tables rules. Maybe they go to some sort of IDS or IPS and configure what processes or files should be written to and so forth. But invariably, that application uh, changes over time, right? And as that application changes, the, the rules that you've created uh, rot, basically, right? So if I configure my rules to protect the you know, traffic to this particular IP address or only allow this specific checksum of HTTPD, as soon as my application is revisioned, those rules are no longer, no longer applicable. And so what most organizations, unfortunately, end up doing is sort of throwing up their hands and you know, doing a very perimeterized approach to security, something that's not very application-centric, where the security is really at the edge of the network, not specific to the individual application. So you know, you're, you're not going to um, have a protection that's specifically for WordPress. Maybe you've got some sort of border firewall that only allows you know, 80 and 443 into those, uh, to those particular IPs, but not much beyond that. And we really feel like, like with containers, you have the opportunity to, to really fundamentally change that approach. That traditional security model is really all based around the idea of some kind of like you know blacklist or block list that you're going to have uh, from a security model standpoint, right? You're going to have a firewall that says you know prevent access to these ports, or you're going to have some sort of uh, host-based anti-malware or, or IDS technology that is specifically looking for some type of threat that's known about and stopping that threat from from being exposed to your application. And while that you know in a sort of an isolated individual model, while that can be effective. The problem that that really causes at scale is that you don't have the ability, when you think about containers, to do the amount of manual effort that's required to keep those rules fresh, right? And again, if my WordPress environment, I'm building that, that application, I'm deploying some virtual machine for that, I might not touch that application again for six months, right? And when I do, I might not change the VMs, I'm probably just going to SSH to them or you know, make an RDP session to them and upgrade the version of whatever software I've deployed there. But fundamentally, like, you know, the VM might still be the same and, and other aspects of the stack might still be the same. With containers, of course, that notion is very different, right? Like, I'm probably going to be deploying that application a lot more frequently. You know, maybe I'm going to update it every week or even every day or multiple times per day. And so you cannot have that model in which you're assuming that there's going to be some sort of direct interaction between the development team and the security team and how my app works and what's going to happen there. And so you really not only have this opportunity to improve security, but you also have really like, like almost the requirement that you use tooling and, and you take an approach, a methodology that's very container oriented, that understands the ephemeral nature of containers, that understands the frequency of, of how often they're being updated, and understands the fact that responsibility is now a lot more in the hands of the developer than it historically has been. So a lot of times organizations will look at that and say, you know, here's some things that are sort of like downsides with containers. But I think what, what we really look at is that there's really an opportunity here to improve the overall defense of the applications as you put them into containers. And the, the reason why there's this opportunity is there's a few fundamental characteristics of containers and the way that containers work that you can leverage from a security standpoint to improve your overall security posture through greater degrees of automation and machine learning that you can apply to build those application-centric policies. So as a, you know, one of the first examples of these characteristics is that the fact that containers are very declarative. If you think back to like a virtual machine, if I were to give you a virtual hard disk, you know, a VMDK file, for example, not only is that VMDK very large, 
but it's basically opaque, right? Like I don't have an easy way to look at that VMDK file and deterministically understand exactly what the app should do, right? It's a full OS, it's got agents, it's got you know various other software inside of it, it's got my own software inside of it, and it probably has some data intermingled in there as well. So it's really hard to understand exactly what it should do. Containers, on the other hand, of course, you know, containers are built from a Docker file. It's, it's relatively easy to be able to parse an image that you're going to run into a container and understand what that should do. You know, your typical image is going to, going to have probably some entry point like an init script or something that, you know, you can parse and you can understand what processes are going to run within it. Um, that init script might call multiple things that are going to happen before it sort of finally launches the container. So you can crawl through that entire launch process and really understand what the application should be doing much more thoroughly but critically, you're able to do that without forcing the developer to create an additional artifact. You know, there's been a lot of attempts at this sort of model, sort of a declarative security model in the past, but almost all those attempts had a common point of failure, which was you required the developer to like create some kind of security manifest that described how their application worked. Um, you know, everybody you know loves to make jokes about lazy developers, so I won't try to do that with you guys. But you know, I think you've all seen if you ask a developer to, to or you know, all of you who are developers for that matter, you know, if you're going to have to do additional work to get your application deployed, people are inclined to not do it or to do it in such a way that it's so wide open that you don't really get the benefit of, of this kind of application centric approach anyway. So the fact that they're declarative is important, but I think even more important is the fact that they're declarative in a way that's very in line with the overall flow and the overall way that you're using those applications. The second aspect that's really important is the minimalistic aspect of, of containers and I guess the images that they originate from. Uh, again, in contrast to that traditional model where you had a virtual machine and it was very big and very opaque, containers are built from an image and, and typically images are very small, at least very small relative to, you know, to what a virtual machine would look like. And that allows us from a security standpoint to be much more precise about understanding exactly what that image should do and to be able to understand the nature of how the application is built. Because instead of having to call, crawl through, you know, 20 gigs of a VMDK file or something, you can look at a few hundred megs maybe worth of, a, of an image that you're going into a container and really have a much more thorough and precise understanding of what that image should be doing when you deploy it and run it inside of a container. So that minimalistic aspect is also really important too because it allows you to, to be able to do this kind of uh, prediction about what the container should do at a much greater level of speed and without the sort of performance overhead you would if you're talking about you know, gigantic sort of, of, of uh, VM files that you would deal with. And the final one, and this one is really also very critical, is the notion of immutability. The fact that the containers that you're going to run are not going to change during their life cycle. And think about that in contrast to a virtual machine. Again, back to that WordPress example that I gave. If I deploy a, a VM that's running my WordPress app and I come out with version 2 of my app, you know, chances are somebody is going to SSH to it or have some, you know, puppet script or something that's going to go to that and is going to upgrade the application but preserve the rest of the VM, right? So the VM over the course of its life cycle is going to change. It won't be running the same binaries and the same configuration today that it did yesterday or that it will tomorrow. And from a security standpoint, that means it's really hard to have a deterministic baseline that you can look at and say, if there is activity that's different than what that baseline predicted, that there's something anomalous that's occurring there. So the fact that those containers are, are very declarative in nature, that we can learn what they should do, that you can learn about them relatively quickly because they're minimalistic, and because that minimalistic knowledge and that, that declarative knowledge is not going to change over time, allows us as a security company, or, or anybody as a security company really, to be able to do some things that used to be hard and to make those things a lot easier than they used to be. So we have this notion of you know, security with DevOps and, uh, agility, but really what the, the meaning of that phrase is, is instead of you having to have that model where some human being is going to describe to somebody else how their application works, you know, again, it listens on this port, it talks to this, uh, this backend database, it does these different things, software can do that learning for you automatically. So in other words, in that WordPress environment, instead of you having to go and tell the security team, you know, my backend is, you know, running MySQL and it listens on this port and it expects to receive traffic from this front end uh, virtual machine, that can be learned dynamically as you build your application. And even more interestingly is because those images are durable throughout their life cycle, you know, the same image that I build in, in, in my uh, development environment, it's the same image I test, it's the same image that I deploy in production, means that I'm able to create that model and use that model across the entire life cycle of the application and know that what I see in one part of it should be what I see in the same other part. So we can begin the learning about your application literally the very first time that we see it, which might be as part of the Jenkins build that you're using to generate that application in the first place. 
So again, the idea is instead of there having to be this manual overhead, a lot of this work that goes into saying like how my application behaves, you can literally begin building that model, that, that list that says here's what my application does, all the way at the very beginning of the life cycle of that application. And that's a really big fundamental difference between that old world security, which again is very manually intensive, very prone to sort of that rule rot scenario, and really is not effective at providing something that's application centric, with what you're able to do with containers in which you can apply those characteristics to really improve the automation, the scalability, and the efficiency of building application centric rules. So what I want to show you guys is, is just a, a little bit about what does that actually look like for us. Um, so I'm going to show you a few uh, examples of, of what we call a model within Twistlock. And the models that we create are, are basically a, uh, a four-dimensional description of everything that a given image should be doing at runtime based on static analysis of the image and machine learning that we do as the image is deployed and actually running in production. So what you can see here, what we're looking at right now is what we call our radar view, which is a, a dynamically generated network chart that's overlaid with vulnerability and threat data that shows all the communication flows, both north, south, and east, west of, of the Kubernetes sock shop app that I've deployed in this environment. But what I want to do is to kind of drill down on that further and show you what, what it looks like if we look at a particular image. So let's look at one that everybody's probably pretty familiar with, which is Mongo. This image that I have, this model that I've created for this image, is something that we've done completely autonomously. There was no rule, there was no human being that had to be involved with this. No one had to sit down and say, these are the rules that I want to uh, enforce. Nobody had to like deploy the app and like click a learn now button and stop learning button and so forth and sort of commit something. This is done dynamically and starts at the very beginning of that CI process. And I want you to note that the image that, or the model that we have here is correlated to the specific digest for this image. And the reason that's important is every time you build a new image, you get a security policy, a model, that's created specifically for the build that you're doing. So if you're making minor changes, you know, maybe you're upgrading like a sub-minor version of Apache or some other component in your image, you're going to have a security model that's specific to that version, and those security models can operate in parallel. You might have like three different versions of your app that are all running as you do some sort of A-B testing. You're able to still have three different security models, one that's correlated to each one of those versions of the application that you have running at that point in time. And you're able to do that without any human error action required. So that's what the digest ID here means. I want you to note that we're able to find out and understand the process that runs here. We see the path of it, but importantly, we also are able to checksum that process and understand like not only is this this particular process that should run, but here's the checksum of it. So we can see if there's any changes to the binary, if somebody overwrites the binary or modifies it in some way. From a networking standpoint, we can learn both from a static standpoint where it's listening, but also behavioral bi-directional connectivity. You know, for example, like what sort of inbound ports does it listen on beyond what might be doing based on the Docker file? What are its outbound port communications? Like, does this talk just over, you know, MySQL, like 3306 to some backend, or does it make calls for, you know, for DNS lookups or to talk to a Redis server or something like that? From a file system standpoint, we understand what files are being written to what paths, what types of files those are, so that we can look for anomalies based on that activity. And what this model allows us to do is, throughout the entire life cycle of this Mongo uh, container, I should say of, of any container that runs this Mongo image, we're looking for anomalies relative to the model. And those anomalies could be across any of those dimensions, you know, process, network, file system, system call, such that if somebody runs Mongo and they do something that's traditionally really hard to detect in, in, a, in a kind of an old world security model, for example, I might have an IP table rule that says I'm going to allow traffic to port, you know, 3306 or 27017 or whatever it is to this host. But it's really hard to say that I only want this specific version of this specific process to be the only thing that can bind to that socket and can receive traffic there. Whereas that's actually a really easy thing to do when you have this automation because of those container characteristics, we can understand that not only should Mongo be listening there, but it's that specific checksum of Mongo that should be listening on that port. And if there's anything else that listens there, even if it's called MongoD, we know that it's not the same thing because the checksum of it's no longer correlated to what we see in the model. And really the idea with everything that we're doing with this, with this runtime defense posture is trying to give you the ability to have very custom tailored application centric protection for all of the images that compose all of the components of your application, but without you having to go through that and create that manually. Um, this radar view, as I said earlier, is, is sort of the graphical representation of what that looks like. So from a radar standpoint, what we're doing is saying we know what all these models are, what should be happening in this environment, then we draw that out and dynamically show you what the connectivity is between all those components of the application, such as you can really easily visualize and see what parts work with what other parts, what the connectivity flows are, 
But more critically is, as we discover that, and as you annotate this by adding your own connections, if there's something that's you know, not expected that needs to be added in there, you can download and synchronize this policy as just a standard Kubernetes networking policy or a standard policy that can be implemented with whatever sort of networking tool that you might be using in, in your orchestration plugins. So this works with things like Weave and Calico. And what this does is it allows us to take the knowledge that we have from that model and express that knowledge in a format that can then be consumed by your orchestration's networking plugins to actively enforce layer two protections that are application centric and are automatically updated every time you deploy your application. And again, that's a really a fundamentally different thing from the traditional old world model in which, you know, somebody would have had to come here and set up like, you know, this source to this destination, allow these ports, and as my application changes, those rules rot. Now in this model, we're able to create those rules automatically based on the knowledge of how that application actually is deployed based on those characteristics of the containers that are there. So one of the things when I often show people this, you know, this, um, this YAML file that's generated here is what's missing from this network policy? IP addresses. And the reason IP addresses are missing is, again, in the new world model of security, the IP address is almost irrelevant, right? It's this ephemeral thing that's just the orchestrators assigning dynamically. You're not gonna be able to create a, you know, an IP table rules or use traditional firewalls that are dependent upon specific source destination pairs. You're gonna have to have something that's really container-centric in nature. And that's why you can see here, the entities, the rules that are being created are saying from what pod to what service over what ports allowed, not what IP address to what destination IP address, because again, the pod is the thing that really matters, not the IP address that might just be a temporary thing at that particular point in time. And so again, the vision that we have and what we're trying to develop for customers and deliver for customers is that notion of leveraging the characteristics of containers to really scale out your application protection, to make it more application centric and more relevant to the specific apps that you're doing and building, and to do so in a way that's much less manually intensive, really rely on machine learning and automation to build those policies. And I'll leave you with one real world example. One of our customers is a, is a really well known um, uh, entertainment company. Um, they've got a very large deployment of, of all their properties that they use to serve out trailers and other digital content for uh, their movies and theme parks and so forth. Um, that, that customer has almost 500 hosts right now that are running in GKE, and those hosts are being used to deliver all kinds of different applications that are out there. They have thousands of images, hundreds of developers that run in that environment. They deploy their application sometimes twice, you know, dozens of times a day because they have so many different teams deploying different things inside of that same environment. And because of the automation we're able to deliver and the, because of the way that application is built, they're able to do all that stuff with just one security architect. It's the idea with this is to really be able to scale out, to, to systematize the way that, the, that, that we do the learning, to automate the process of creating the rules, and to be able to, to create those rules in a way that they're always gonna be in sync with the applications that you have because of the integration that we have and leveraging those characteristics of containers. So I'd be happy to take any questions anybody has at this point before, before we wrap up. No questions at all? Yes. The question is how is that integrated with Jenkins? So we have plugins for Jenkins and other CI tools so that as you do your builds, you, we begin not only showing the developer really detailed information about the vulnerabilities and giving them granular ability to like fail builds based on CVE state and so forth, but also use that as the opportunity to start learning about the image, right? Because we can see the image there, we can understand what its digest is and begin doing the static analysis part of that learning right in the CI process before it's ever even pushed to a registry. Other questions? Yes. When you rebuild the profile, do you use the previous knowledge of the profiles that you had before? When we rebuild the, the model, do we, do we use the same knowledge that we have before? We don't. And the reason for that is, number one, it's actually very efficient for us to do it, so it's not a, a really computationally expensive operation to create the model. But secondly is, it's really hard to reuse knowledge that you already had before without creating false positive situations. Because the whole idea is that as you build a new version of that app, there can be many differences between the previous version and the current version. So we don't want to rely on assumptions about the way that it used to work, simply because it happens to have the same you know, tags or labels associated with it. So every time you create an, an image, we treat that as a distinct entity from the beginning. Absolutely, yeah. So the question is, do we work with other orchestration engines such as Swarm, DCOS? We do, um, even, even sort of, uh, I would call it proprietary, but even like uh, AWS, ECS, the same basic principles apply there as well. Do you detect bad behavior? What can you do from there? 
the, the question is, if we detect bad behavior, what, what can be done from there? There's basically two different things that can be done. One of them, and, and obviously what most people do with security tools, is you have the option to alert on that. So you, we emit our audit data through a variety of open approaches. You can you know, actually pull it from us uh, via REST API. We log it through standard RFC syslogs. So you can consume it with a SIM and alert on it like that. We also give you the ability, though, to block those. So one of the fundamental things that we do is, is to give you a policy construct where you can say, if I encounter anomalies at runtime, I want to block and prevent that, that container from continuing to run and prevent the orchestrator from continuing to deploy it. You can also use that same blocking to enforce uh, whatever vulnerability and compliance rules you have to prevent images that are vulnerable or, or non-compliant with your standards from ever being deployed in the first place. You can create a rule, for example, that says, if my image or the image that's being attempted to be deployed has a Java, severi Java vulnerability with a medium severity or higher, prevent that image from being deployed. Or if it contains the CVE for Heartblade, prevent it from being deployed. Or if it runs SSHD or runs as root or whatever it is, you can have these very granular policies that allow you, again, to automate the enforcement of whatever your security standards are across your entire fleet of, of containers. What's the impact on performance? Great question. Um, we actually, in our most recent release, moved our application from being uh, built around Node to being built on Go. Because as we had more and more customers and you know, customers that had more sophisticated scenarios, we we're starting to run into some, some kind of ceiling limitations with, with Node. Um, so now we have some customers that have, in, in some cases, uh, 20,000, 25,000 images that, you know, that they have, you know, several hundreds or even thousands of hosts that are being maintained. And so typically the performance overhead that we have is on an individual host that we're protecting uh, is usually somewhere less than 1% of one core. Um, and occasionally if you have lots of images that are being deployed at the same time that need to be, that need to be scanned, it might go up to 2% to 4% to of, of a single core in the box. And the memory overhead is usually somewhere around 50 megs of, of consumed memory on the host. Static code analysis, we, we do from a variety of things. So we definitely do binary analysis. Um, one of the things that, that's important about our approach, though, is we also pull vulnerability data from a very wide range of upstream sources, which means that our data is very precise. So we go to Red Hat for Red Hat vulnerabilities, Ubuntu for Ubuntu. We have commercial providers. We cover Ruby and Python and uh, Perl and, and Java and so forth. Um, and we're looking at that not just at what's existing through the known operating system package managers like you know RPM and Yum and so forth, but also third-party package managers like NPM and Maven, uh, Maven, as well as any sort of uh, application that you've added, just you know just sort of like an add or a copy line in a Docker file of a particular binary. That's where we do the binary analysis for it. So it really doesn't matter so much how you get your application assembled, you know, we try to have coverage for it regardless of what package manager or even just sort of like a raw copy that you do into, inside of your app. Probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. Anything else? You can, so you can look at the, the models. We always keep all of the versions of the models available. We do automatic garbage collection after two weeks of a model being inactive. Um, but you can always inspect and look at, you know, this version of my app has this setting and this version of my app has this other setting. We also give you the ability, and, and a lot of customers will, will do this if they have applications that, that sort of are corner cases that you know, may not be able to be completely learned comprehensively with machine learning. We have the notion of rules, which are sort of in addition to a model. So a model is always learned by us and is not editable by a customer. And a rule is something where you have exactly the same configuration options there about like what ports and processes and so forth, but you configure it so that you can create a rule that's very generic that says like apply to any image that's called foo star. So whatever like new version of that I'm gonna have, I know that this rule is always gonna apply there. And then the way that we calculate what the result in policy is, is we take whatever's in that explicit whitelist, the model, we add whatever is explicitly allowed in the rule, and then we subtract whatever is explicitly blocked in the rule. And the result of that calculation is the effective uh, runtime model for that, for that image at runtime. So you really have a lot of control over it. What we've seen from our customers is about 85 to 90% of the, of the images they have are completely handled through machine learning, and obviously we continue to try to improve that. Um, so the, the number of places where you have to create rules is typically pretty small, and it typically tends to be things like Jenkins, if you containerize Jenkins, or other things that do a lot of like change as they run, and some of those are very hard to predict in, in advance. Like with Jenkins, it tends to run lots of different processes, but those processes may only be exercised when you run particular build jobs. And so you can't always predict that at the very beginning definitively everything that it's going to do, and so sometimes you use rules in those cases to supplement the models. Any other questions? Last one. Thanks. Uh, well, we got one more. You get twist lock onto a host you're protecting. You have uh, 
you basically have a couple of ways to do that. So um, everything that we ship is a set of Docker images. So you can just load that into whatever host that you're using. We also are really orchestrator uh, aware. So if you're using uh, Kubernetes, you can deploy Twistlock, to our, our console, our management database and so forth. You can deploy that as a pod and have Kubernetes manage the HA for that. Every one of the nodes that you deploy our Defender container to, you can do with a daemon set. Same thing with like Docker Global Services, DCOS, and same model for all that. And if you want to check out Twistlock, please come by our booth. It's G10. We also have free evals and would love to work with any of you guys. Just twistlock.com. Thanks for your time. Thanks for coming.